Welcome to our first uh, federal government class uh, in which uh, we will uh, start discussing um, the uh, formation of the reality that we will focus on uh, this semester, namely the uh, United States of America, the political system of the United States of America. And <clears throat> normally, um, or um, if I would have uh, been more precise, I would have called this section uh, that on the syllabus and on Blackboard is called uh, Foundations, I would have called it uh, Nation and State Building. But you don't know those concepts yet, so I just called it Foundations, but you will see that in fact what we will talk about in this first section is uh, the processes of Nation and uh, State Building. Uh, so uh, let's see uh, how uh, that goes. Well, in order to, to get there, um, we will have to clarify certain concepts and uh, in fact let's talk a little bit about concepts what concepts are why, why they're important uh, in any theoretical discipline uh, such as political science um, that deals with ideas meaning uh, um, concepts are the main tool of, of, of work yeah uh, the main instrument of work uh, think of concepts as, as a wrench as a key that a mechanic a car mechanic would use to fix a car right or a plumber would use to fix the plumbing system now if that that professional does not have the right wrench or the right key the right size if they're not precise if they're dented uh, the plumber or the car mechanic cannot do anything, right? Now, this is uh, the same uh, role that concepts play in a discipline like political science. Concepts are like keys or wrenches that need to be uh, very precise, very refined, um, uh, very specific. Uh, and what they do is they help us uh, take apart uh, and uh, break down the social and political reality that surrounds us. This is why in this class I will insist on you paying attention and understanding and being able to explain very precisely, very, very precisely, exactly, uh, and with, very, uh, with, with carefulness, uh, the concepts that we will discuss. Uh, so you will, I can guarantee you that you will get questions on the test in which you will be asked to define certain concepts and you will be expected to define them very, very precisely just like we, uh, you know, according to the definitions given in class. So I, I tell you this because otherwise um, you, you're not getting what you should be getting from this class, which is again the instruments needed in order to understand, i.e. break down the political reality that surrounds us. So. Uh, pay attention to these concepts, be able to uh, uh, explain them uh, uh, very precisely because these are your tools of understanding political reality. So um, one of the first concepts that we need to talk about is the concept of a state. Uh, and uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, well, um, if we look at the map of the world today, yeah, what you will see is, uh, as you can see on your screen, uh, is a patchwork, and this, these are, by the way, materials from your blackboard, <coughs> is, a, is a number of uh, different patches of different colors, right? And which signify, what do they signify? They signify what we would call, in, in general parlance, countries. But the more precise uh, name uh, or concept that would... Uh, uh, denote what these patches are, these patches of different colors, uh, the concept that we're looking for is state. These are different states, right? As a country is not the wrong word, right? But it's too broad. It's not the precise concept. The precise concept is state. Uh, and what is interesting about this map, although at first sight it might not seem interesting to you or surprising, is that at this moment in time, there is no inhabitable spot on Earth that has not been assigned to a state. And not only that, uh, this is the first time in history when, when that is the case. Uh, this meaning like the last hundred years or so. Yeah? Uh, and to, so it's the first time in history when, when, when all inhabitable uh, spots on Earth basically have been assigned to a state. And to prove that, I will uh, just take us uh, only 200 years ago which is nothing in the scope of human history. And, and suddenly you notice that, that the map of the world looks differently. And there are the entire parts of the, of the inhabitable lands of the earth that are white. Well, why are they white? Are they white because you know, it's snowing there or it's covered in ice? Obviously not. Uh, 
so so why uh, are they white are they white because there's no human beings there obviously not yeah africa has been very uh, popular very much populated you know at, in the, the 1800s in fact you know human civilization uh, started in africa so um so what is missing what is missing is this concept that i may uh, that i uh, mentioned this concept of uh, uh, statehood uh, in the modern understanding of statehood uh, so we're going to have to see what state, what statehood uh, uh, means, uh, because um, does this mean that at that point you know there's human beings living in Africa? You see the the, the white, uh, you know here. Uh, does it mean that there is no sort of, no form of political organization? No, any human society that ever existed had a form of political organization, uh, more formalized or less formalized. Uh, you know, even if you take your family to and live in the mountains secluded, and you have children, and you know you branch out, that is already a society, and as such, will have a form of organization. And politics is nothing but the organization of society that's what politics is so any society that exists has a form of organization even if it's uh, in the sense of who takes decisions how are decisions taken and who takes responsibility for what who does what yeah that's it any society that exists organizes itself that organization of the society is politics right so don't think about politics in terms of voting or parties that's just one form any organization of a society and the smallest form of society is the family has uh, has a form of organization and has thus has polit political organization so do they have politics they do have politics but so that's not what's missing what's missing is as I, again what i mentioned is is what we understand today by the term state but we, before we get to this concept of state let's um let's step uh, a little bit back because the, our definition of state will um, uh, we'll use this other concept that we need to uh, uh, define first, namely the concept of institution. Now, remember the, in our first class, I mentioned that in this in this class, uh, in this course, uh, we will examine politics, American government, from uh, historical, institutional, and comparative perspectives. Um, and I mentioned that I will define. We will talk more about what an institution is. We started talking about it. We didn't go uh, too far. So what is uh, uh, an institution? Um, well, uh, this, and, and please take good notes, uh, by the way, throughout the video lecture. So an institution is a group of people uh, performing uh, the same set of tasks towards a common set of goals Uh, with uh, continuity in time, right? Uh, so uh, an institution is a group of people performing the same tasks towards a common set of goals with uh, continuity uh, in time. Uh, this is uh, what I mean uh, by that. Um, so <clears throat> let's give some examples. Yeah, let's give uh, uh, some examples of institutions. Well, institutions can be uh, highly formal or formalized and can be informal ones. So uh, an example of a very highly formalized institution, uh, which is you know, a deeply established institution, is, for example, Texas A&M and a &M University at San Antonio, right? It is highly formalized because it has all these charters and documents and a legal uh, entity identity. Uh, it has, uh, you know, uh, bank accounts. It has all these, you know, it's highly uh, uh, formalized in, in documents and, and other forms. Um, but what makes it an institution, right? Uh, again, it makes it an institution the fact that there is always a group of people performing the same tasks, a certain number of tasks towards the same goals with continuity in time. So uh, what makes it a university is that there are certain groups of people called, for example, teachers, right, professors who teach, there's students who learn, and there's administrators who administer the, the, the entire uh, system, right? And uh, the people who inhabit these roles, right, keep changing, right? So I'm a, uh, if, you know, a new faculty comes in, uh, they stay a few years, maybe they move out, but it does the university doesn't cease existing because teachers, someone will be there to teach, right? The functions remain, right? So you can think of institutions as a number, as a set of, uh, of functions, a set of roles that 
that keep happening, that are keep being fulfilled over and over again towards the same goals. Now, who specifically fulfills those roles? That changes with you know human beings come in and come go out. They live and die. But the institution remains. So we have universities that are hundreds of years old, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, go back say, six, five, six, seven hundred years, right? But obviously, if human beings have lived and died in this space, what remains? Not the buildings. Buildings can be torn down. This can happen in a tent, for uh, uh, all that I care, right? The, what is constant is this performance of the functions, right? Or let me give you another example, the, the Postal Service, USPS, right? There's always, what is, what makes it an institution, USPS, yeah? It makes it an institution, what makes it an institution is that there's a set of people set, uh, that always do what? Deliver the mail. Now, is it the same human being, Jim or Bob or Jim, uh, you know, Michael or whatever, who delivers the mail? No. And you don't care actually about uh, their names or their personal identity because what you care is that there's some there's a role that keeps being fulfilled over and over again, yeah, and that is uh, uh, that is what makes it an institution. But these are highly formalized institutions, USPS, uh, um, any business, any social reality that is constant is actually an institution. Everything that surrounds us is made of institutions. Uh, everything that surrounds us in terms of human-made social reality that is constant. Is an, is an institution. Ac accidents, the fact that we happen to be in the same spot at the cafeteria for like 15 seconds or even 10 minutes, that, that's not an institution. But if, uh, if we keep gathering there every other every day at the same time and we talk and we form a group of discussion that that becomes an ongoing social reality right that becomes a discussion group and suddenly that's an institution right so uh, some institutions can be in very informal for example you have a bunch of friends with whom you play pick up soccer or pick up pick up basketball twice a week uh, if that happens you know, the week after week, month after month, year after year, that becomes an institution in your life and it shapes your life. It's a, it's a constant social reality. That's my pick up soccer, pick up basketball group, right? And people might come in and go out of this, of these groups because they move in, whatever. Um, the existence of the practice of the functions that are fulfilled makes it an institution, right? And remember, everything that exists in terms of uh, social and political reality is actually made of institutions. That's because they continue to exist, insti the, the institutions. That's what gives them permanence. So San Antonio itself is made of institutions, right? Um, the United States is made of institutions. All that we consider to be a social world is made of institutions. Okay, uh, so uh, just to... Um, a review then, an institution is a group of people performing the same tasks uh, with, uh, towards a common set of goals with continuity in time. Um, uh, okay, that uh, being said, let's uh, go back to what we were talking about in terms of uh, uh, a world of states and what is a modern state and why is this uh, uh, important. Well, let's, uh, let's just go to... Um, let's say uh, even further back in history to the year 1000, but again, which again is not very far, think, keeping in your mind then that there have been empires that have lasted for thousands of years, a thousand years in itself is not that much. And you notice that again we have um, a map that shows us uh, a lot of um, uh, empty uh, uh, spots. And why, uh, you know, all these white spots? Why is it so? Obviously, again, not because human beings don't live there. There's plenty of human beings throughout, yeah? What is missing is not political organization, but specifically this reality of the state. And the, the places where you see this reality forming first is Europe, Western Europe, but Europe in general. And that's what I wanted to point out, that um, the, the modern uh, reality of the state uh, was formed came about in Western Europe first, and but by now it has spread throughout the globe. And it is worth asking ourselves, like, how come that the state now has become such a popular model? Uh, why is now the dominant model of political organization so much so that there is no single inhabitable space on the globe that is not assigned to a state? But that is quite an uh, astonishing uh, uh, feat, right? Quite an astonishing achievement for this uh, this this uh, political invention of the modern state 
has proven to be immensely immensely successful because now it covers the entire globe why is it so well let's see why so let's go to you know 1400 uh, zoom in to western europe where this uh, modern uh, uh, reality uh, was formed and uh, i'm just going to navigate like you know about uh, 100 years uh, um, forward 1500 and pay attention to the map 1600 1700 okay so what do you notice what that that these patches of different colors uh change yeah that that uh, what we call borders yeah which is the uh, line between states yeah uh, they keep changing now why are they changing why do they keep uh, uh, changing and this is very important to understand uh, uh, and to to really understand what this means when you look at a map, especially in the in the Middle Ages. Um, the reason why these patches keep changing and of different colors keep changing is because um, power gets projected um, uh, to uh, different uh, power gets projected by centers of authority. Um, in towards new lands, right? To that they claim to uh, control. Uh, what do I mean by this? Okay. Okay. Uh, let me. Here's. Um, Let's say we are in the Middle Ages. Let's in the Middle Ages. Here's basically how power uh, manifested itself: political power. You had a center of power, right? Let's say it was a, a king, a prince, or something, who lived, uh, you know, in a castle, in a fortified castle, in a, in a, let's say there was a city surrounding it, right? Um, and uh, this center of power projected its power outward. But what you need to understand is that, let's say, in, you know, you're in the year 1500, 1600, 1400. Um, this projection of power um, uh, outward, right, keep dimin kept diminishing uh, the further you went from the center of power, right? So the closer you were to the center of power, to the source of this authority, the more the authority of that ruler manifested itself. Why? Because the, uh, this is the area over which this ruler, this source of authority, had actual control. Because in order to have control, you need human beings to um, uh, uh, implement, to apply that control, right? Now, the f because that number of human beings was limited and was only basically around his court, the farther you went from the court, from the source of authority, the less control you had the less this control manifested itself the less this the more this power uh, tapered off and it diminished right so what you had in the middle ages were centers of authority that projected their power outward but it diminished the farther you went out why is it so why is it so because what uh, this ruler was missing but what the modern state has is a group of people who is able to exercise to implement the will of this ruler every day with continuity in time over and over again over the entire territory. So what did I just describe? I described, uh, what did I just say? I just told you that what this ruler was missing was a set of, was an institution, right? An institution that would, meaning a group of people performing the same task, meaning implementing the will of the ruler with continuity in time, right? Throughout the a large territory. Why were these rulers missing this? Why is the modern state uh, a, a, modern, a modern reality uh, uh, and only came about about 200 years ago, 150 years ago, the modern state? Um, because uh, in order to sustain an institution, you need resources. Think of, the, as I said, the Texas A&M uh, University. Think, so, think of, uh, you know, the USPS. You need people who perform the same functions. Well, in order for them to perform the same functions, you need to what? You need to pay them. You need to give them offices. You need to pay the rent there. You need to pay electricity. You need to organize them. There's a whole system that includes, that involves a tremendous amount of resources. And that's true for any institution that surrounds us, from the transportation system, the, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, you know, the, 
uh, traffic lights, everything that surrounds us that is a constant reality, right? Uh, the police, the army, the anything. That is maintained. It's an institution that is maintained with a tremendous um, uh, uh, expense of resources. Yeah, uh, and why didn't these uh, rulers had these resources? Have these resources? Well, where do they rulers get their resources from? Right? They get because nobody is you know uh, uh, born you know uh, infinitely uh, rich. Right? The rulers would get them from what through extracting resources from the root, meaning through taxation of one form or the other, right? But what do you need in order to extract taxation? An institution, right? You need people to go there and extract taxes and enforce, again, your will over and over again. So it's kind of a vicious circle. You need an institution to extract resources, which you can then use to maintain those institutions. So how did we, do, did we get to a certain point when this became possible, when the, mod, when the modern state, the modern rulers, suddenly had the institutions necessary to extract taxes and then to finance uh, this? Well, s many things had to happen uh, and, and that, they, that came about only in, modern, uh, in modernity, such as uh, you know, a transportation system, I mean, Meaning uh, the possibility of transportation, of communication, meaning a system of roads, uh, uh, a system of communication. So certain aspects that um, uh, come about, you know, in the about 200, 150 years ago, mostly um, that allow for for the modern state to create the system of institutions that both extract resources and then maintain institutions. Um, and the first modern state of that kind was actually Prussia, P-R-U-S-S-I-A, Prussia, uh, because, uh, which is a Germanic state, a small Germanic state from in the north of Canada, Germany, um, which was, a, uh, the reason why it succeeded in doing this, it was, it was it, uh, because it was a militaristic state, yeah? So a militaristic state like ancient Greece, uh, like in ancient Greece, Sparta, which was a state, yeah, a city-state, a militaristic state has the entire um, uh, society and entire economy geared towards uh, war, right? That's what makes it a militaristic state, meaning that all the resources are meant to, all the people are bred and raised to be warriors and all the resources go towards warfare. That's the entire ethos of the, of the, of the society and the direction of the state. Uh, that's what Prussia was, yeah? That's, um, but uh, because it was a militaristic state, uh, the ruler, uh, uh, the power of the ruler was based uh, and supported by a network of military garrisons that were established throughout the country, right? So um, think about, um, so this is, if this is Prussia, then you have here, you know, throughout this, let's say this is the territory of Prussia, and then you have, you know, in every single uh, big, big, big city, uh, or every single region, you have what military garrisons with a commander, with um, um, uh, you know soldiers and so on. Who, you know, one thing you know about the military is that there is a clear chain of command. So who are directly under the command of the ruler? Uh, and who at this point are used to basically protect the territory and to, uh, you know, uh, 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 attack others if need be and so on. But because this network exists and it actually covers the entire country, uh, suddenly, you know, why not give these uh, garrisons or, or other roles as well, which, you know, once we have con direct control over them. So why not give the commander of the garrison also the power to govern that territory, not just the garrison? And why not give them the, also the power to extract resources and meaning to collect taxes from that territory? And suddenly, what do you have? Suddenly, you have an institution that what does what? Collects taxes, and then with that, those taxes, the institution is maintained and growed, grown, right? So suddenly, you have this aspect that, that, is, uh, that, that allows for the center of authority to have institutions that project their power throughout that territory equally because they have the resources to maintain them. And this takes us to the modern uh, definition uh, of, of the state. So what is the, modern of the, of the definition of the modern state? A state yeah, is a set of institutions with sovereign power over a territory and a mem membership. Yeah. 
Before we get to explaining exactly what I mean by this, and we're going to get back to this uh, definition, let's let's go back to the to that map of, uh, uh, of of Europe in the Middle Ages and remember that we asked the question of why were the borders moving, why were the, those patches of different colors moving? Yeah, so uh, let's just go there. Um, so what was changing here? Remember, we're talking about the business before the modern state. Yeah. So what changed here is that there was a source of authority, a ruler, who managed to, through inheritance, through alliance, through, through weddings, right, you, uh, wedding, uh, um, giving, uh, let's say, their daughter in, to ma in marriage to the prince of a different uh, uh, land, yeah, managed to gather control over different lands. Uh, so what I'm trying to point out here is that the change, these changes in the patches of these cars or what we call borders are not changes in population. Wh whoever lives here in this area, in these areas, are this, you know, they remain the same people whenever, no matter who rules them, right? Um, what I'm trying to, to differentiate here and to help you differentiate, in fact, yeah, is the difference between, st between a political power or what we call a statehood or authority or political authority and versus the group of people who inhabits a, 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 a stretch of land. And what better example than here, if you look at this map in front of you, where you see with yellow, you see this, this yellow being both here and in what today, which is today Spain, and in what is, uh, what is today Southern Italy, and what is today Sicily, and uh, 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 Sardinia, and also uh, uh, a little bit of Switzerland today, and Netherlands and Belgium. So was Spain, and, and even it even says Spain here, which is, makes no sense, right? Because this is where Spain is. So why do they are they calling Southern Italy Spain, right? Was it because they just sent a lot of Spanish people there? No, that's Southern Italy. What this denotes, and this is the differentiation that we need to make, and not to make the, the you know, not to project modern realities over uh, uh, political realities of the past. What this map shows you is the power of the Spanish crown, yeah, of the ruler, of the Spanish king, who inherited or conquered or uh, you know uh, borrowed or whatever, got through wedding certain territories, territories in other parts of Europe. Like, for example, way in the north of Europe, what today is Netherlands and Belgium, which is definitely not populated by Spanish. Yeah. So, so this map, this map of patches of colors represents uh, the, the the areas over which a certain ruler's authority extended. Yeah, extended not uniformly as as we mentioned, because they didn't have the institutions to to control the entire territory, but claim them, uh, send troops there, and so on and so on. Or got, you know, uh, sometimes the ru rulers of a country were invited to also rule the other country because, you know, they just offered protection and so on. But that didn't change who populated that country. Furthermore, uh, you know, identity, uh, the, the identity, the cultural identity, ethnic identity uh, in history, but also today, uh, is is mostly region based, meaning regional. Uh, think about uh, this: unless you move, yeah, let's say you don't, you are born in a place and you never move away from that place. Now, how much of how much territory and how many people will you actually get to know personally to to really call it your own, yeah, in a lifetime, yeah, but really know it, not just passing through and so on, yeah. That's that's not very that's not that much. Right? That's not that much. It's basically, I don't know, the, the amount of a county or two or something that you really feel it's your own, that you know, you know, every space in it and it's, it's really yours. Yeah, that you really are familiar with. And how many people do you get to know? Right. Even today, when we have transportation and Internet and so on. Well, go back to the Middle Ages or whatever. And you, when you didn't have Internet and, and, and northern modern means of transportation and and you will see that identity, cultural identity, the dialects, the habits, the customs were mostly regional, regional meaning like a valley, a valley had its own identity. And if you just want to see that even today happening, you can go to, for example, to Switzerland, right? Switzerland, <coughs> which is a confederation of the different uh, uh, provinces um, uh, that, that 
and the reason why it's a confederation of different provinces which each have speak different languages and have different habits and traditions is because it's highly mountainous yeah so transportation never became much easier so you have these major you know spaces between the the mountains like these valleys and each valley had its own language and customs and identity including cultural identity right but today to the other day they confederated forming you know this confederation of switzerland but the identity is is local is regional yeah uh so in the middle ages this is why you see these patches of different colors moving around in spain the spanish king controlling parts of northern europe because what territories these uh, sources of authority controlled had nothing to do with the identity of the people in there yeah uh, because uh, nobody cared what the peasant what language the peasants spoke and and all the dialects and in the different you know valleys and and regions uh, what dialects they spoke and so on because uh, you know the peasants who couldn't re read or write because for most of uh, Western European history after the year uh, you know 800 let's say until about 1800 uh, the language, the common language of communication between those who knew how to read and write, the intellect, the, those who were uh, scholars, the, the rulers, was Latin. And that was the language spoken throughout Europe by those who knew how to read and to write. That was the language of publication. That was the language of letter writing. Yeah? So Latin was their common language. The, the, the language of the peasants and of the people who couldn't read and write, nobody cares. And authority, as I said, uh, 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 was not linked to whoever necessarily to with whoever populates a specific area think of this like in ancient greece in ancient greece you had there's never existed a country called greek greece in in the ancient times a state called greece what you had you had city states athens was a state uh, sparta was a state and and on and on and on in the middle ages in italy and not to the renaissance there was never such a country called italy until about 150 years ago because what you had was city-states, you know, you had Florence famously, right? You had Rome and you had uh, different Pisa and so on and so on. You had other states, city-states, yeah? And yet they understood each other. They, uh, 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 you know, if, if you traveled, they would speak different dialects of, you know, what today we call, uh, you know, Italian or you know, more or less resembling each other. Uh, and it was the Italian peninsula and they understood that there is some common co commonality of culture, but that's not that does not a, a, a state make that does, does not a country make so, so what i'm trying to help you understand is that the reality of the state as let's go back here a set of institutions with sovereign power over a territory and membership has nothing to do with the identities of the peoples who live within that territory like a state can exist like as a set of institutions controlling an area where there's like 50 languages, 50 different ethnic groups, 50 different types of identity. Those, these are two different realities. Uh, so we shouldn't confuse that. Now, later on in modernity, these two realities of who lives in the territory and, uh, and how the states are drawn and what uh, the set of institutions um, that is the state uh, what kind of a territory does it control and what who are the people living there these realities of state and population came closer to each other but one is a state and the other one uh, in modernity we will talk about it will be the other concept of nation a nation is not a state a nation is a group of people with similar characteristics for example the united kingdom is a multinational state yeah the united kingdom is a state but it has several nations within it, meaning several groups of people with different characteristics, I Northern Irish, English, Scottish, Welsh. Yeah, those are different nations. So a nation is a group of people with common cultural characteristics. A state is a set of institutions with sovereign power over a territory and a membership. These two are not the same reality. Okay, one is a set of institutions, doesn't matter who they rule over. Yeah, so keep this in mind. So let's go back to, to this, this, uh, this definition then of, of the state. A state is a set of institutions with sovereign power over a territory and a membership. Let's see what this actually means. So a state is a set of institutions. We understand what that means, right? Because we define institution. But not just a set of institutions, right? The Texas A&M University system is a set of institutions. The USPS actually is a set of institutions because you have different branches in different states in different counties and so on. 
So what separates the state from other sets of institutions is that it's, it's made of a set of institutions with sovereign power. What does it mean, sovereign power? So let's define sovereign. Sovereign means uh, power exclusive of external or internal rivals or enemies yeah sovereign means power sovereign power uh, sover sovereignty means power exclusive of any external or internal rivals or uh, enemies so uh, let me give you an example um the so, or, or let me show you what what uh, what what i mean um the modern state looks kind of like this. The modern state has a source of authority that over a given territory, and whatever that territory is, is the territory you know um, uh, that the state defines through its power, meaning as far as it can extend its sovereign power. So the modern state has a center of authority that through its institutions controls every single aspect of the territory, um, defying any external or internal enemies or as as they say the the state is a the modern state is a, is a jealous god who, who supports no other gods besides itself right what uh, what do i mean so with these institutions the the the, the modern state yeah um uh exercise sole control over this territory which is what makes that territory that territory uh, uh, to belong to that state. For example, um, in today's world, right, we talked about the fact that we live in a world of states, uh, that there's no territory, inhabitable territory, basically on Earth that has not been assigned to a state. And that's true. But however, uh, in many there are territories that have been assigned to a state namely states that exist on the map or on paper or through international treaties right because these borders between states in modern days are recognized by the states each themselves each other through treaties yeah uh there are states that exist on the map or on paper but are not actual functioning states because they lack the uh, they don't fulfill the definition that i just gave you so, for example, uh, Somalia, right? Somalia is a state that exists on paper. If we go to the map of today's map of the world, it's there in Africa, but it, it only exists on paper. There is no effective government there. Why? Because what is missing is this, right? What is missing is a set of institutions that would implement the will of the government throughout the territory, right? And the will of the government is basically are basically the laws. What is a law? A law is a sentence, yeah, that gets implemented, that gets uh, 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 put in effect, yeah, by someone, and it gets put in effect by someone not just once but continuously, right, in time. What makes it a law is that this sentence is applied over and over again, during the day, during the night, at 11 p.m. and at 8 a.m. But who is able to? implement this sentence to put in effect this decision throughout over and over again well our definition and only an institution can do that and there are states today in the world that do not have the system of institution because they don't have the resources uh, they call them failed states haiti is another example of that today uh, unfortunately right uh, a state that where the government exists only on paper because it's not able to set up and maintain institutions enforcing its will, yeah? Uh, like what institutions? For example, you know, uh, a law, you know, is enforced by what? The police, the different institutions like the IRS enforcing the tax uh, uh, system, uh, the judicial system, you know, uh, the army, the border guards. So there's, all, there's a whole sum of institutions whose job is to implement the law, right? Law is not law unless there's someone to implement it. Because, you know, uh, I can proclaim my, my, myself the king of uh, San Antonio. I, I just proclaim myself. Does that make me a king? Why? Is it just because, uh, you know, I, 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 nobody believes me? Well, that doesn't matter if anyone believes me. <laughs> what matters is whether or not I have the institutions that would uh, transform, that would put this in application. 
that would make this a reality, that would uh, make it so that any good decision I take becomes reality for everyone who lives in San Antonio. That would make me the king. Doesn't matter if anyone believes me, if I have the institutions to enforce my will throughout San Antonio, that would make me the king of San Antonio. That's all there is to it, yeah? Um, so the modern state has this. So there's uh, so there are states today that are quasi-failed states because they don't have these institutions. There are other states today that um, are, are almost failed states or on the way to or part, partially functional states because they have control but not over the entire territory. And, you know, we just have to look in, uh, in our neighborhood in Mexico and there's the regions of Mexico where the central government actually uh, effectively does not have control anym anymore where uh, it does not is not able to enforce law and order anymore because actually those areas are ruled and controlled by cartels there's Spain, there's <coughs> or look at colombia uh, there's areas of colombia in the jungle which are controlled by rebel groups completely so it's that's an area where the state literally doesn't you know where the institutions of the state they don't even enter there they don't even go in yeah, that's on paper is part of Colombia. Yeah, this is a region that is part of Colombia on paper, but only on paper. Because effectively the central government does not have the institutions capable of enforcing their will there. There's other people who enforce uh, uh, their will there. Okay, so that's what sovereign means. Sovereign means uh, a power um, exclusive, exclusive of any internal, right? Like these rebel groups or cartels or external enemies. The example with external enemies is Ukraine, right? Ukraine during, during you know, in the conflict with, with, with Russia, uh, when Russia uh, controls, uh, you know, 20% of the pop, uh, so Ukraine on paper, right, is a whole state, but um, uh, on paper, because 20% of its territory is actually controlled by an external rival, which is the Russian Federation. Uh, at least at the, at the time of our video right now, right? Uh, so on paper, uh, Ukraine is grain, but actually 20% of it, uh, the state is not able to exercise its sovereign power, hence the conflict there, because there's an external rival. So back to our definition then, a state, yeah, is a set of institutions with sovereign power, and now you understand what sovereign means, over a territory. And the existence of borders today Right as uh, we went to, you know, the the world, the map of the world today, 2023, right, 22, uh, on this map, um, the existence of what we call borders, right, is only uh, they only signify the point of contact between two modern states, right? Because that's what creates the border, right? If you drive south from San Antonio towards Laredo and keep driving towards Nuevo Laredo, uh, you will be stopped. Who will stop you? Some people wearing a uniform saying you can't enter. Well, why can't you enter? Because that is the territory of a different state uh, called Mexico. And that's the, uh, and you see, uh, and their uh, uniforms signify what? That they're part of an institution specifically set up to tell you not to enter, right? So modern states use institutions to enforce their power throughout their territory, the borders which don't exist in reality, right? Because when you fly over, you don't see borders, right? Fly over con whole, whole continents, you'll never know which country you're over because borders are a human social construct, are not a natural reality, although sometimes they correspond with natural you know, barriers. Uh, but political borders are not a natural reality. Borders are the uh, uh, are a result of the capacity of a state to enforce its authority up to a point, the point where it meets the authority of a different state. That's the clashing point between those two forms the border, right? And again, you know it because you encounter literally the institution, the members of the institution who day and night, day after day, perform the same tasks towards the same goals, right? the border guards to to enforce the authority of the state up to their border. OK, well, let's go back to 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 this um, uh, to this definition of the state. The modern state is a set of institutions with sober, sovereign power over a territory and a membership. Uh, <clears throat> 
notice that we talked about how the this modern set of institutions uh, projects power, sovereign power over a territory. But what about this membership thing? Uh, because the definition is only complete with the membership part. Uh, a state is not for, uh, has sovereign power not only over a territory, which we have shown, but also membership. What is this membership? What does it mean to be a member in a state? Well, another word for that, very simply, is citizenship. Citizenship is membership in a state, right? And in today's world, not only has uh, uh, all inhabitable area uh, uh, territory on Earth been assigned to a state, every single inhabitable area on Earth have, uh, has been assigned to a state, but also every single human being who is born on Earth is assigned at birth to a state. Through this membership in a state, through what we call citizenship. And nobody is asked basically if they want or not because you're assigned at birth. Also, by this is by conventions between states. Uh, by convention between states, we have decided that every single human being needs to be assigned to a state. Why? Because this membership in a state, this so-called citizenship, is the the only legal uh, relationship, the only legal uh, um, uh, sort of status that gives you certain that 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 entitles you to certain. Uh, rights and and uh, obligations and responsibilities uh, that obligates you to certain responsibilities meaning membership in a state in a, is a sort of a, a contract again that you didn't choose at birth but you were born into it because you were assigned to a state well, of course later you can renounce your citizenship and get another citizenship and whatever uh, but the rules are pretty difficult about uh, getting that but anyway um, being a member in a state entitles you to claim protection from that state, claim certain rights from that state, and also it gives you certain duties towards that state. Yeah, One of the worst things that can happen uh, for a person on Earth today is to be without citizenship, which can happen through various accidents. Uh, uh, for example, there was this uh, movie in the 1990s with Tom Hanks, you can look it up, called Terminal, uh, which is about an airport terminal. Uh, and it's a, based on a true story where uh, someone from, you know, somewhere in Central Asia flew to Paris, France, and when they took off, the state of which they were citizens existed, but when they landed, by that time, the state disappeared because the borders changed and whatever, whatever. So basically, when they landed, they were a, they, they were a citizen of a state that never that didn't exist anymore. So basically, they had no citizenship. <coughs> And that's one of the, uh, 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 to be stateless today, which is to have citizenship in no state, to don't have a citizenship in a state, is the worst thing that can happen to today if for you because there's no one to go to to ask for anything because no one has duties towards you. This is why the whole system is set up so that you're, everybody's assigned a citizenship because that ensures that s some s state entity is responsible for you. Uh, it's also it's part of the rules and regulations in today's world uh, that states cannot take away citizenship from from uh, uh, from their from their from their citizens. Uh, it's very very hard to take citizenship away. Uh, very very rare. It's very very difficult. Um, so um, why? Because again, because the whole system is set up so that when you're born, you need to be have an entity, a political entity that is responsible for you. And you know uh, this, you know Tom Hanks, the Tom Hanks character, or the person that the story is based on. Uh, that person was in the airport, stuck there for for months and months because they couldn't go into France. Because when you go, okay, as as I said, you drive towards uh, uh, Nuevo Laredo, towards Mexico, and you get to the border. The only group of people who have uh, 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 an innate uh, right. Uh, to enter a ter the territory of, the st of a state are the citizens of, of that state. Only the citizens of a state have the immutable right to enter that territory. Yeah? Anyone else, the citizens of other states, can only enter that territory based on agreements between that state and your state. Yeah? If your state has an agreement with that state that allows free circulation between these states, then you can enter the territory. Sometimes it's more difficult. It requires visas and approvals and permits and whatever, whatever. 
but you have no right to enter the territory of any other state unless uh, unless you know you uh, as a citizen um, of your own state you know have received this right because of a treaty between your state and that state that's so the irony of the whole thing is that if in the Middle Ages, you know, it was very easy to travel around because, as I said, the authority didn't spread throughout the territory, the authority of a king, of a prince, and so on. Uh, so you could travel easily because, you know, uh, there was no you know, set border guards like we have today because there were no sets of institutions that would exercise that function over and over again. But what was the downside? The downside was that it was also very very dangerous to travel even between cities right because there was no 911 you could call because there was no set of institutions with that would cover the entire territory that you could call up so this um, exchange of order versus security right uh, ver order that gives you security versus freedom that comes with insecurity and danger that's kind of the the tension and the conflict that we uh, find ourselves in um, throughout history but today is a, is, a, is a world in which you know it's actually uh, the hardest to travel in the sense of you need permits you need agreements because every single land where you would go is claimed and occupied by a state right which was never the case before and they have the power to enforce their will as well which was never the case before uh, but uh, so you say oh my god I'm no longer free on the other hand that also gives you security because you know when you're on your own uh, state's territory the state there ensures that there's law and order you can call 911 you can call the ambulance and so on and so on there's all these institutions that are for, you know the state grants for you and maintains for you and when you go to a different country because of the treaties between your state and that state that state will treat you acceptably right they, they won't treat you as a citizen maybe even like a citizen but they will treat you acceptably right nicely yeah because of this agreement furthermore if something happens to you in that state like in let's say mexico or you go to qatar you go to india you can go to where you can go to the representative representative of your state in that country and that's called the embassy right each country will have these represent representatives in other states where their citizens can go for help and this is why as i said in in uh, in the definition a state is a set of institutions with sovereign power over a territory but also and separately over a membership because the state has sovereign only one uh, uh, the state of wh which you're a member has sovereign power exclusive power over you as its citizen and when you that doesn't just happen on the territory you remain a citizen of this state yeah even if you leave the territory isn't it if you travel to Canada, you don't lose your citizenship. If you go to the Bahamas, you don't lose American citizenship. You remain an American citizen. Your relationship with the American state remains. Uh, and uh, that's what grants you the right to go to the American embassy in whatever country you find yourself to, to claim rights and uh, obligations and, and, and so on, to ask for help, right? So back to our definition. The modern state is a set of institutions with exclusive power, with sovereign power over a territory and separately over a membership. And today we live in a world of such states, it's in a world of sovereign states. Of course, some of them are not able to completely enforce this, this, this sovereign power, but we live in a world of states. Now, how did we get here? And how did we get to the point where in the North America we have, we have a state, right, which is the USA, which is a state, according to the definition the USA is a state that is actually called the United States which is a contradiction in term and indeed it is a contradiction in term so let's see how we uh, uh, how we uh, get to um, to this uh, to this point so let's just go to the um, to the time of um, uh, colonization um, the time when uh, you know the beginnings as i said of this this reality that we call the united uh, uh, states uh, of um, america so this is the year 1600 and what do you see here uh, well let's let's just look at the north uh, uh, central and south america right and you see yellow and what does this yellow signify well obviously it signifies that this state here that uh, as you know it's um, uh, spain yeah uh why is it yellow here is this spain well no of course not right it's not spain spain is here 
So what does it mean? It means the same thing as the yellow that is on southern Italy or northern Europe in today's Belgium and Netherlands and so on. It means that the authority, the crown of Spain, the king of Spain has projected its authority, has the state has projected its power to a different continent. Yeah. Why is the state able to project its power to a different continent and how, what does that mean? Uh, projecting its power, uh, right? It means projecting its institutions. What are those institutions? Well, first it was some, you know, discoveries, but then it was obviously uh, the military, uh, some administration, uh, some religious organizations, right? So these were its institutions that were sent away, right, to do the bidding of the mother country or to do their own bidding, right? Like in the case of the religious institutions, they were meant to uh, propagate the Christian faith. Uh, so they had their own duties. And the state of Spain kind of, you know, had to support them. Um, so that's what's happening here, because remember, these continents, right, North, South America, Central America, are they inhabited at this point? Of course they are. They have like old civilizations. They have a post very interesting political organization. Remember the Mayan civilization, the Inca, whatever. <clears throat> either still existing or the vestiges of those so there is political organization but what isn't present in South uh, and Central America and later in North America there you don't find a modern type of state right so at this point the European states and mostly Spain France Britain also Netherlands uh, um, there's a few others but these three especially and Portugal yeah and Portugal uh, these are strong states that have opening towards the oceans, right? And that have the capacity to project their state power to other continents. And that's what is the process of we talk about colonialism or colonization or the extension of empire or whatever it is. It's the projection of modern state power to other territories. And what allows for this projection is the fact that wherever they land, they don't encounter a force uh, able to withstand this projection of power. Why? Because whatever the political organization they find there, it's not the modern state. It is not a set of institutions with sovereign power. Because what's special about the, the modern state? Uh, with, through its institutions, not it doesn't only control a territory and a membership, but it also extracts power, it, it extracts resources from throughout this territory right it extracts taxes it is it extracts duties from you and if it, there's war it can extract human resources right the drafts right in world war ii the entire economy of the country by uh, you know decision of the federal government was put in the service of the war right so you stop making cars you made tanks human beings yeah they were called through the draft into the army that is a tremendous capacity. Through its institutions, the modern state is able to extract money, resources, human force, and to put it all towards one goal, to put it all, as it were, into one fist, and this one tremendous fist that in which all the wealth of a country, of a territory, of a membership is concentrated. This is a tremendous fist. With this fist, it can punch wherever it wants. Now, unless you have a, another similar state uh, facing it, nobody, no, no other form of political organization can withstand this clenched fist. And this gets us closer to what we asked at the beginning. Why is the modern state as a form of organization so successful? Well, this is why. Because, you know, it's not like people necessarily wanted to pick up this form there, but in our, our, as the other continents encountered this projection of power from the European states, they realized that the only thing that could oppose or stop this projection of power was a similar state. This is why today we have a world of states, because throughout the, all the continents, everybody woke up to the, to the realization of the fact that unless you have a state, you cannot withstand the power of another state. So now we will live in a world of states, which is basically allows each state to stop other states from doing the same thing, from punching the other state. Because look at uh, Western Europe, right? In Western Europe at the same time, there are borders because Spain, if it wants, goes north, it encounters a modern state. Spain, uh, France, France, if it goes across the channel, it encounters a very powerful state called uh, England or Britain or the United Kingdom. So, you know, they can go that way. So let's go to places new where we don't encounter this political reality of the modern state. So, so that's, that's the process of colonization. Now, 
while this process of colonization is happening, uh, what we have to ask ourselves is, uh, uh, because it happened throughout, you know, uh, Central, uh, South, uh, North America, it happened in Asia, it, and later in about a couple of centuries, it will happen also in, in, uh, in Africa, right? Australia and so on, right? And what's interesting is the, the, the different outcomes uh, that resulted from, from this. For example, look at South America um, and compare it with North America. Uh, and look at the different outcomes of the process of colonization. Because look at South America, because what you see there is not um, uh, the same thing that you see as the result of colonization in North America. Or, or let me compare it differently. Uh, the, Britain, the British have... Uh, established uh, control over India in Asia, yeah, and also over North America, <coughs> or at least started colonizing both, yeah. Why don't we have today, instead of a country called India, which exists in Asia, right, and there's also Pakistan as the, you know, another result of the same process, uh, but we have India, uh, although English colonists were there, and yet it was the natives who formed a state eventually, called India. And yet in North America, we don't have native Americania, right? We don't have uh, the Apaches or the Comanches or the whatever uh, Native American group, the Iroquois, the whatever. Uh, the, 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 we don't have a, a, a state formed by these native groups, but we have a state formed by the British. Because what we call today the United States of America is a British formed state is a state. Uh, it, was, it was the success of the British colonizers who took over, you know, half of the continent or a third of the continent, and then they controlled it and formed a British, you know, an English state. This is why we all speak English, right? Then, we, you know, it, it broke away, it broke relationships with, the, you know, with England, but it's an English-made state, and it's not the natives who won over. Why did the natives win over in India? and not in North America, or if you look at South America, why don't you have Spain or a Spanish, you know, uh, 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 countries, right? Uh, Spanish made countries in South America, you have the Spanish language, but if you look at it, <coughs> it's clearly that you have a mix of natives with colonizing Spanish, right? None of these countries are, you know, the Spanish, you know, or the descendants of the Spanish, and that's not the case in North America. Furthermore, why you know, because if you go to 1713, for example, 1715, for example, um, you notice that there are three major powers uh, in, in, in North America, um, right? You see the, 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 the Spanish, you see the French, and you see the, uh, the British, you know, the red, uh, right? Sp Spanish, French, British, right? Why, you know, although the Spanish were first in North America, aren't we, uh, we're not speaking Spanish as the first language, and this is not a Spanish sort of uh, uh, republic, the United States of America, right? Why is it not speaking French? So why were the British colonies so successful, although they only occupied this very tiny sliver here, and not the French and not the Spanish? Well, let's let's look into the causes of the success of the of the British colonies, and and see why they why they were so uniquely successful, even compared to other places where Britain was present. The West Indies, as I said, later in Africa, uh, India is a great example, right? But today we have India, and we never would never call that a British-made state. I mean, a, a British a, a post-British state, so to speak, right? meaning British established and British made and sort of populated by descendants of the Mayflower, so to speak, in, Indi in, in India, right? Why? Well, let, one of the reasons that differentiated the North America from Central and South America was that uh, although clearly there were plenty of, uh, uh, um, uh, there were Native Americans when the colonizers arrived, of course, the number of Native Americans uh, was, is estimated to have been when the first settlers arrived about 10 million. Now, 10 million uh, for, for, you know, if you put them all in one space, 10 million people is a lot. But if you spread them throughout the continent, right, of North America, 10 million is not much. <laughs> so one reason why the British were so successful was the, the, the fact that the continent was sparsely populated, relatively speaking, yeah. Uh, so there was space for expansion. There was space for, for, for occupying and for, for claiming and so on. 
That's one reason. And take notes and be able to uh, explain these reasons. Uh, the the other reason uh, we're moving to to other uh, reasons. One of the other reasons was let's just compare uh, the you know the differences between these three sort of um, um, the territories claimed or controlled by these three European powers. First of all, the Spanish claims to like the Spanish uh, control of North America, <clears throat> although they were the first there, first of all, the Spanish were not really interested in North America. They were more interested in South and Central America because here the resources were at readily at hand because they already encountered existing uh, existing populations uh, that, that had civilizations. There was gold, there were, uh, you know, there was, uh, the riches were already, uh, already at hand and Getting to North America, which was sparsely populated, and you go to the, you know, these lands where we find ourselves, right? It's very hot, it's very dusty, there's nothing there. So they weren't that interested in North America, uh, the Spanish. Um, furthermore, uh, the main way in which the Spanish projected their, their um, uh, authority or their control towards North America was through two means. One was forts meaning military garrisons and the other one was missions and you know as you travel throughout south southwest south uh, southwest U um, uh, us today and california you know from the names right santa fe uh, holy faith and so on and all the names that are religious in like san antonio right all the names that are re religious in nature and you find the old missions so you see the 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 you know the the remains of that but what is it what is common between forts and missions they're all populated solely by males right so male soldiers male monks and priests and so on missionaries yeah well what is needed for a society to become established and 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 grow and prosper uh, and maintain itself beyond just the first generation well, you need to have reproduction, right? You need to be able to produce, produce children, uh, to raise them, and they would grow, and they would get married, and have children, and uh, grow, and on and on and on. That's what a society subsists, uh, maintains itself uh, through reproduction. And you need males and females to have reproduction. Well, the Spanish didn't have that. They didn't establish real uh, societies in most of North America, like uh, uh, real lasting societies with men and women and children and that, that were prosperous and growing and so on. How about the French? Well, if you look uh, closely at this, uh, you know, the blue part here, you will notice that most of it is along the rivers, the Mississippi and then the lakes and another river. And, and why? Because this actually, <coughs> this territory that was claimed by the French was actually a trade territory and the rivers were for were used as highways for trade right the places where the, the French actually established themselves were at the beginning here at, at, at the ports right what is today Quebec yeah in Canada and what is today New Orleans Louisiana uh, and uh, in the United States and this is why in Quebec they are still speaking French right in Canada and in Louisiana and New Orleans you still have French you know culture remains and so on again because these these are the only places where the French actually established real growing societies with men women and children and families and so on the middle was mostly just for traffic basically just for commerce just for uh, travel <laughs> transportation and they had some forts here right that's not the case with the british with the british uh, 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 colonies and if you look at, uh, at the maps uh, here on your blackboard you see first map <coughs> is the eastern seaboard and uh, a number of uh, Native American groups that existed here uh, already when the settlers came. Obviously, these are not real borders because there were no states, right, uh, formed by Native American groups, but it kind of shows you uh, how they were distributed generally, where they roamed, and so on. Um, so I'm just putting this here just to, you know, they were already here, of course, right, but they had no real, uh, not no sort of modern statehood. This is another map that shows you the earliest uh, settlements and 
you know, at the beginning, the settlements were literally just like a small settlement the, on the coast. Uh, and most of them didn't survive because of disease, because of conflict with the natives. Uh, and you have here English settlements, uh, Dutch settlements. For example, new, what is today Manhattan was initially New Amsterdam. It was a Dutch settlement and so on and so on. Uh, but this is an interesting uh, map that I really like because it shows you uh, and it, it shows you the, the uh, British uh, colonies, settlements, then colonies on the East Coast. And what you notice, notice exactly, notice how the, the borders between the colonies are clearly drawn, uh, yet the borders westward are tapering off. Because this is, I, like, I really like this map because it kind of uh, is very telling as it shows you what was going on. Because what was going on is that they settled on the coast and they started expanding and more people were coming, right? They went further west, further west. Uh, so why were these borders clear between the colonies but not westward? Well, because each colony had its own institutions of government. So the border, the limit between the authority of South Carolina versus the authority of Georgia, the government of Georgia versus government of South Carolina, the 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 place where they clashed, i.e. the border, was very clear because there was a system of institutions that made this economy, that governed this territory and implemented the law. Uh, and and it, when it went far enough, it, it clashed, it met the, uh, sovereign, the, the power, not sovereign, the power of the government of another colony. All of these being obviously British people who uh, uh, settled here. However, westward, they didn't meet any sort of state like form, right? These aren't states, right? These are colonies, these aren't just, you know, formations. But in the westward, they didn't meet, it wasn't like they, there weren't like natives westward, but it wasn't a state that they met, so there was no clear border. Um, uh, so, so, okay. So back to back to our map. So what do the what do these uh, uh, colonies, these British colonies, have in common? Is that w as soon as they came, they came well immediately. They came to remain. They came to form real societies. Uh, with they came with men and then women and then they had children and reproduced and had families and uh, the society uh, maintained it, its existence in time because you know, one generation passed, the other generation was born and so on. Other people are coming in as well, but what maintains a society is a, as well is its capacity of reproduction, right? That's what, that's what ma maintains a society in time. And that was different between these, as I said, as I mentioned, between these three powers. So here's the second reason. A third reason was, uh, for the success of the British colonies, was the fact that they, ma they managed to find uh, ways of economic viability. Uh, managed to find ways to be economically successful, meaning uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, managed to find ways to survive economically, and they did that in the north. It was mostly commerce, merchants, uh, uh, trading. Uh, who were they trading with? Uh, uh, well, Britain. Uh, and in the south, it was mostly agriculture. In fact, the first big crop, as you probably well know. Uh, that made the southern colonies successful was tobacco. Once they cultivated tobacco and managed to sell it towards uh, Britain and then uh, towards Europe, that was a huge cash cow, so to speak. That was a that was a jackpot, yeah. And then it was cotton, right? So um, uh, agriculture in the south and north, it was uh, uh, more uh, trade uh, and so on. Uh, so that's the third thing, economic viability. They managed to find ways of being economically viable. So not just having children, and, and but also being able to make a living. The fourth reason was the fact that in, at this point, uh, the British uh, Empire was on the rise while the Spanish Empire was on the downward you know, uh, trajectory, uh, Portugal even more so. Uh, and France, although it was uh, powerful, it remained powerful, it was not actually ever really interested in North America. Uh, they were more involved in European politics. Um, and uh, they were big rivals of Britain, but they never really invested in North America, in, invested themselves, plus they had their own, you know, economic crisis and, and whatever. So the power of the, the raise, growing power of the British Empire was one of the reasons why these British colonies were also successful. Uh, and 
this takes us to the, I don't know, maybe it's the fourth reason that we mentioned, uh, or the next reason that we mentioned, that we, we should mention is the fact that these, um, the British Empire allowed for the British colonies to have trade, international trade, that all happened within the British Empire. Right, because at this point the British Empire will have interest in the West Indies, the Caribbean. It will have interest in the, in the, <coughs> in the East Indies, meaning the India today. It will have interest and colonies in uh, North America. So basically, uh, you know, 300 years ago, uh, you were in, in Boston and you could drink tea from India, right? Uh, now, if I find tea, actual tea from directly from India at the store, I'm happy even today. Because, you know, uh, these, you know, bag teas are not the real tea. And, you know, it's not that easy to find actual Indian tea or Chinese tea, you know, real raw tea, uh, leaf tea, right, in the stores, even today. So, but at that point, they were able to do that because the entire commerce, right, the entire uh, supply chain was within one empire. And the entire supply chain, uh, the British Empire, was protected by the power of the British Navy. So that's another reason why the British uh, colonies uh, uh, were uh, uh, prosperous and, and successful because they have the continued support, not just uh, military, but also economic and the privileges given economically and the opportunities provided economically by uh, the British Empire. Okay, well, that's, <coughs> that's about the colonies uh, and uh, the settlements, but how about, you know, the other populations there because uh, we, we are in danger of forgetting that, you know, this North American continent was already populated. As I said, the, these spaces are mostly projections or claims to power of the, of the, of the, Sp uh, of the Spanish crown, of the uh, French crown. This is more populated, however, yeah, uh, by the British colonists. Um, but this is all, you, as you can see from this map, it, there's plenty of native populations. Well, how about them? How did they welcome this arrival of different settlers? Well, again, because there was no, not even the concept of the modern state, so no clear borders, and the relationship between different tribes and different Native American groups were, you know, fluctuating. They warred with each other. They had alliances with each other. Each of them had their own lands where they roamed. Uh, you know, some lived peacefully with each other. Some didn't meet each other ever. You know, when these new settlers came, the relationships were equally, you know, varied. Because, you know, you know, some were welcome. Some, you know, had uh, immediately relationships of trade. Because it wasn't the case like today, where you where you want to enter a territory, it's already controlled by a modern state with its, with its institutions, right? There was no such thing. So the very concept of having border guards and you know sovereign power didn't exist on North America, right? Of course, as these colonies expanded westward and the more they bumped into settle, set, uh, like established settlements, they're not just you know roaming grounds and so on of of these. Native American groups, the more the conflicts uh, became more acute uh, and, 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 and resulted in wars and bloody conflicts and so on. But, you know, uh, at the beginning it, it, it varied. Some, you know, some early settlements were massacred by the natives. Some early settlements had uh, amiable relationships and traded with the natives because, again, why not? It's like trading with another native group, although these weirdos are, look completely different and behave differently. Um, and, you know, many natives became part of these new colonies because they were met a reality with, that they did not know at all, right? This idea of, you know, modern statehood, right? Of quasi-modern statehood. And, you know, the, they were also more advanced technologically, the, these uh, colonies and so on. So, you know, natives were attracted to live there and so on. So the relationship, you know, varied. But one thing is clear that as these colonies tried to, you know, push westward, the more they encountered uh, the closer they get to centers of Native American power, right? Core, core nucleuses of, of you know, uh, established settlements, and that's when you get to, to, you know, endangering their their existence, and that's where you get to to more bloody uh, conflicts. And uh, let's conclude here uh, today's uh, 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 lecture. We'll con we'll continue uh, with. Um, discussing another important group group of uh, population that will um, uh, start appearing in North America, uh, which is the as, as a result of the slave trade and how that happens. Uh, and then we'll move on to see how these colonies from, you know, these are British people. Yeah, these are British colonies, British people. 
what is the process by which from British colonies and British people who benefit from the fact that they're British because that allows their survival and protection and so on, they decide to uh, split away from their mother country. So what leads up to that? So we're going to talk about that in the next lecture, um, and and for the ne in the next lecture we'll also talk about the Declaration of Independence as the, uh, we're studying the document in uh, detail. Um, so uh, thank you very much, and I will see you uh, in the next um, lecture.